This is the story of a brilliant young Victorian, an amateur whose invention ranks second only to the wheel in the history of transport, and of the ship he built to demonstrate his invention. Our story begins 200 years ago in 1819, when the very first crossing of the Atlantic using a steamboat was successfully made. The paddle ship Savannah was built in America in the state of Georgia. As she passed the coast of Ireland, the Coast Guard, having never seen a steamboat before, put out to rescue the ship, thinking that she was on fire. Maybe news of this crossing reached a Kentish postmaster's son, Francis Pettit Smith, a talented young model maker, who would have been interested in this combination of paddles and sails. Even a crude model would have been enough to demonstrate the problems of such a hybrid. One paddle plunges into the water as the bloat heals, whilst the other lifts clear out of the water. One alternative to paddles would have been Archimedes screws, which were well established for use on land, but had not yet been successfully used for propelling ships. It was Francis Pettit Smith who within a few years would successfully demonstrate a propeller-driven model boat and go on to patent the placement of the propeller used to this day. But for inventors young and old, things do not always go according to plan. Young Smith's insight was to place the propeller in the dead rise in front of the rudder, thereby directing water flow onto the rudder and making steering more effective. Smith built a two-foot, clockwork-driven model to test this idea. The next step was to adapt a boat big enough to carry a steam engine and its boiler, which needed a vessel around the size of this fishing boat. It was during the early trials of this six-ton vessel that a fortuitous accident occurred. The double helix propeller, which was made of wood, hit a floating object in the water and broke in half, leaving just half of the propeller, which, to the surprise and delight of Francis Pettit Smith, markedly improved the performance of the vessel. The reason for this is that the stern half of the longer Archimedes screw was not adding much thrust as it was churning water that was already moving fast. Instead, it was increasing drag by complicating the water flow. That's why a shorter propeller is more efficient than a longer screw and why modern propellers use only a part helix for even greater efficiency. The success of this prototype would have been sufficient to convince Francis Pettit Smith that a short screw mounted in the dead rise would be superior to paddle wheels. The question was how to make his fortune from this invention. He needed to convince the Admiralty to adopt it, and that would need him to demonstrate a full-size ship. Building such a ship would be an expensive and risky venture. Francis Pettit Smith secured the backing of a private banker, Mr John Wright, and a small consortium of backers who together formed the Screw Propeller Company, sometimes referred to as the Patent Screw Propeller Company. It was they who backed the venture costing £10,500 which today would be the equivalent of well over a million pounds. The full-sized vessel was designed by Henry Wimshurst at Blackwall, part of the East India docks. The ship had an overall length of 125 feet with a beam of almost 22 foot, displacing 232 tonnes to be named the Archimedes and launched in November 1838. Unfortunately, the limitations of early steam power prevented the Archimedes from demonstrating the full potential of this design. So, 
Model maker William Mole decided to build a steam-driven scale model using a 3D printed reconstruction of the Archimedes' propeller to see how it would have performed with a modern engine. Will, how precisely were you able to copy Henry Wimshurst's design? The plans are lost for the ship, uh, so it's based loosely on a paddle ship hull of the time without the paddles. It, it's really from this picture here uh, that the whole line's been taken, uh, which is the only evidence that we have uh, left of how the ship looked. A ship cell is constructed much like a human body, with a spine and ribs to protect the vital working parts. The spine is referred to as the keel, and the ribs are spaced out frames over which planks are then laid. Each plank laid onto a ship's hull has to be measured and fitted. The bottom plank, known as the garboard strake, is fitted into a deep groove carved into the keel. One of the most difficult tasks in the early part of powered shipbuilding is setting in the propeller shaft which is laid at a slight angle to the horizontal of four degrees in the case of the Archimedes so that the propeller gives a slight down thrust keeping the stern firmly in the water. The area at the stern of a propeller ship has to be strengthened in every way possible. Note how the support to the propeller boss has been reinforced with overplanking of the rudder post, a detail shown on the block model of Smith's original patent. With the planking completed, the inner support frames are removed, leaving the hull ready for waterproofing and fitting the boiler and engine, which is where our model diverges from Smith's Archimedes. Smith's Archimedes had a low pressure boiler built by the Rennie brothers at Blackwall, which burst during trials, killing the attendant engineer. The replacement boiler built by Miller and Ravenhill could not provide sufficient steam, and the Archimedes used a primitive steam engine that turned so slowly that it needed a heavy, noisy system of gears to turn the propeller at any useful speed. The combined result enabled the Archimedes to turn her screw at only 22 revs per minute. Will, does your boiler produce a higher pressure than Francis Pettit Smith's boiler on the Archimedes? Indeed, yes. Uh, he had to manage on about um, 10 psi. This boiler is quite happily working at 60 psi, uh, pounds per square inch, that is. Um, so it's, it's a, a high pressure boiler and it manages to dispense, therefore, with a gearbox. Indeed, this higher steam pressure, coupled with a modern engine, enables Will's propeller to turn over 10 times as fast as Smith's Archimedes, giving his model an agility and turn of speed that Francis Pettit Smith could only have dreamed of. Nevertheless, Smith's Archimedes was still superior to the paddle ships of the day, and he desperately needed to recoup the massive investment that the Screw Propeller Company had made. A promotional tour of the Archimedes was arranged, including a visit to Bristol, where Brunel was building the Great Britain. Brunel could immediately see the advantages of screw propulsion and hired the Archimedes for his own experiments, following which he gave orders for the paddle wheels to be stripped from the Great Britain the engine turned through 90 degrees and a low noise gearing system installed. The Admiralty, though, were reluctant to fork out for the rights to Smith's patent. Their decision was complicated by a series of inventors, such as Ericsson, patenting alternative screw designs. The Admiralty organised their own trials 
culminating with a tug of war between their own propeller ship, Rattler, and a paddle ship named Alecto. Their building of the Rattler must have knowingly infringed Smith's patent, but they knew that Smith was in no position to sue the prospective licensee on whose goodwill his fortune depended. The real tussle was not so much the tug of war between the ships, which the Rattler easily won, as the financial struggle between Smith and the Admiralty. What was on trial was the ability of patents to offer adequate protection to brilliant but unqualified inventors like Smith. Successful engineers like Brunel saw no need for patents. Innovative ideas were their way of solving problems, and solving the problem was to them sufficient reward. Likewise, the Admiralty saw no reason to pay for good ideas, patented or not. Instead, they invited Smith in 1845 to participate in their prolonged experiments, seeing his influence diminish and hopes of monetary reward slip away. Undeterred, Smith, in his new role as a consultant, made a further breakthrough, solving the final remaining challenge of designing a watertight bearing for the propeller shaft. This was a major breakthrough and copied worldwide, but by now Smith had lost faith in patents. Meanwhile, with the Admiralty having built its own propeller ship, the Rattler, the Archimedes had served its purpose. The owners cut their losses by stripping out its engine and reverting it to a sailing ship. Finally, in 1851, 13 years after the launch of Archimedes, the Admiralty made an offer to all the patentees to settle for a joint sum of £20,000, of which Smith was entitled to only a one-third share, considerably less than the cost of building the Archimedes. Smith had been shabbily treated and outmanoeuvred and returned to sheep farming on the island of Guernsey. This venture also failed, but in 1860, Bennett Woodcroft, a fellow inventor, secured him a job as curator of the newly established Patents Office in what is now known as the London Science Museum. No one could have understood better than Smith the importance of patents to allow inventors to recoup the investment needed to prove their inventions. In 1871, Smith's achievements were finally recognised with a knighthood. He died in South Kensington three years later, and his friends amongst the naval engineers and architects raised a memorial to him in the cemetery at Old Brompton. His name is largely forgotten these days, even though his invention surely ranks as one of the most useful and important of all time.